I want to just bring the word of the Lord to you. This week again, I want to really do something a bit different today. I want to speak on creatives. I want to speak on song. I want to speak on worship. I want to speak on praise. I want to speak on the creative aspect of the kingdom of God. Because really, it's all about the kingdom of God. Everything is in the book. And this is a Bible study. I want to welcome you to this Wednesday. Boost is powerful. It's a great meeting. And I do believe that God has a plan for us. So let me start by telling you what I want to speak on. The topic today is developing a worship culture. Developing a worship culture. And I want, to, I want us to look at the right order of worship ministry. What's the right order? If there is a right order, then there must be a wrong order. So what are we doing wrong? What can we do right? And this is some of the things I want to do uh, in this meeting today. First of all, I want to start by laying the foundational truth that the Bible is a book of songs. Now, what are songs? Songs clearly are musicals and abstracts. That's what songs are. What we call songs today are actually what the Bible represents by what, we, what was abstract and uh, musical. Exactly the word uh, that is in the Hebrew that is pronounced sheer. Okay? It basically means clean, uh, musicals, abstracts. So God has a plan, God has a position, and God has a place that he has put him in for those of you or those of us who are trying to use music as a vehicle for ministry. And so if you are right in the room today and you are a music person or you are a worship person or you are a content developer or you are a writer or you are a creative person, even if you are a dramatist, that I really have something I feel God will have me share with you today. Uh, the Bible is a great resource. It's a great resource, a great treasure of resources for anyone that is doing anything in the area of creative. Sometime back, I shared on uh, uh, the song of the bow, which basically was David's eulogy of his friend. He wrote a song, in fact, and he said, this must be institutionalized as a song, as a, ref a ref reflection of talking about the legacies of people who have gone past. So I want to share some things basically about the purpose of songs. Let me say to you, first of all, that the word of God, the Bible is so rich and so influential in that over the years it has influenced some of the greatest minds in music. And um, readily that comes to mind was Beethoven. Beethoven, one of, one of the greatest composers of all time. And I was doing a little bit of writing and I stumbled on some material written about him by Caltech, I think California uh, Tech. And I want to say exactly what it says. It says, as early as 1818, Beethoven showed genuine interest in true worship, in true church music. Did you hear that? Which to him was defined by the musical styles of the earliest composers of religious music, like Palestrina. He wrote notes to himself to look through all the monastic church chorals and strophes in the most correct translations and to find perfect prosody in psalms and hymns. And this is something written about Beethoven, the master craft composer who would go on and change and uh, provide direction for how uh, symphony music is done in the world. So clearly I'm trying to say to you basically that the church has something for you. God's word, the Bible has something for anyone who is, wants to do anything creative. And I said to you, even if you're an actor, you're a content developer, in any way you want to create musicals or abstract or creatives, I want you to listen to this. It's going to help you a great deal. I want to share a first principle by looking at a case study between um, uh, the song uh, written by Moses. Moses, most of the time, what we know Moses to, to do is he parted the Red Sea. <laughs> but what you didn't know is that Moses actually was a worship leader. Moses crafted worship direction for the whole of the Hebrew nation up till today. I want you to please follow me. In the book of Exodus 14, verse 30 and 31, um, and if you read it all the way to Exodus 15, verse uh, 1 to 4, and I just quickly want to look at a few scriptures from there. We're talking about Moses, the song of Moses now. Listen to this. It says in verse 14, in chapter 14, Exodus 14, verse 30 to 31, all the way to Exodus 15, verse 1 to 4. It says, that day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. This is talking about when God brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and you know the story, they crossed the Red Sea, and then all their enemies died in the Red Sea. The, the plan of Pharaoh was that 
the people were going to be brought back. So he pursued them. After he had left, left, left them to go after the last plague which killed his firstborn. You know that story? He left them to go. So they went as they were on their way to pass the Red Sea. He just suddenly got in. Now look, this guy got, I have to go bring, bring them. So he tried to bring them. But the Bible says all the people of Pharaoh, all his army and his mighty men perished in one single day in that Red Sea. So Moses wrote about it and designed a song about it. So the Bible says in that verse of scripture, in verse 31, it says, And when all the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they put their trust in the Lord and in Moses, his servant. So this is something, miracles will do something to, for those of you who are trying to lead people or lead a corporate or lead a family, you need to live a life of the miraculous. You need to be a manifestation, a proof of the power of God. And I'm praying that for someone here today, that your leadership will peak as the miraculous begin to function in your life. All right, so let's go back to the issue of Song of Moses. So in 15, it says, Then Moses and the Israelite sang this song to the Lord. Did you hear that? So that which we call Exodus or whatever it is, the Bible calls it a singing of the song. It says, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, the horse and his rider he has hauled into the sea. Verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Verse 4 says, Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hauled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. I want you to note this last statement in that scripture. I want to read again. So in the course of Moses' writing the song, singing the song to the, to the people, and, it's, and Israel singing to the Lord, he says in verse 4, I want to read again. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hauled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Now, that's in verse 4. That same Exodus 15. Look at verse 20 and 21. Uh, Bible says in verse 20, Then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women who followed her with timbrels and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. And then she spoke the exact same word that Moses said. He says, Both horse and rider he has hauled into the sea. Now, the question that Bex for answer is, what did you notice in the song of Moses? I want us to really interact with this. What did you notice? Especially in verse 4 and verse 21. Okay, so Moses said something, and Miriam, the prophet, echoed it. All right, what Moses sang, what Moses wrote as a song, Miriam took and put music to it. Moses was not a musician. He was a prophetic leader. He had had a mandate from the Lord to lead the people out of bondage into the promised land. That's, that, was his, that was his job description. That was his mandate. And as he went into that, he knew that God was bringing a word to him for his people. So he wrote it down. He documented it. And he taught the people the lyrics. But music has to be added to it. So this was what Miriam did. Miriam took the word of Moses and she added music to it. The Bible says she took a timbrel in her hand. That's like a tambourine. So it's what lyrics and music must move together to make it a song. So Moses gave the lyrics. Miriam the prophet put the music. And so there must be a combination. I want, to, I want you to follow me on this because it's very important. What am, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that every songwriter or every musician is not a voice on his own. But an echo of an apostolic voice. Now this is very principal and foundational to developing a worship culture. In a local assembly or in a family or in an organization, it's very, very important for us to understand the right order. What's the right order? The right order, there must be an apostolic leader who speaks a word from the Lord, and then there must be a prophetic leader, okay, called a worship leader, who picks that word and puts music behind it, and then together it becomes a powerful song that will bring the glory of God upon the earth. Very important. So every Moses needs a Miriam. Every Miriam needs a Moses. Every apostle needs a prophet. So we need to be a team when we are trying to develop a worship culture. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So there must be those people in our local assemblies who are very creative and very talented. Okay. Like Miriam. 
who have very strong prophetic anointings in worship, just like Miriam. But there must also be a desire in their heart to submit themselves under the leadership of a Moses leadership, of an apostolic leadership, and seek to pick a word from the mouth of the apostolic leader that they will put a trimble around and form, form into a song. When both of us work like, like that in a team, the glory of God hits the ground. Amen. So every created person or gifted person must put himself in a local assembly with a responsible leader where you can deploy your creative gift. So I want to say this. I want to advise you. Stop floating. Stop floating from church to church. Stop floating from John to because you are creative, because you are gifted. So people, people, people say, I want to apply my trade. I, I, I want to go to the highest bidder. I'm working for this church or I'm a worship in this church, but the next church down the road gives me a better offer. I'm, I'm jump, jumping there. Now, you need to understand that this is not how this thing works. There must be a clear understanding that your gift is not for commerce. Your gift is to be a blessing to your world. And you need to understand where God has planted you to be able to use your creative gift to be able to augment that work of the Lord and put you forward. That is the right order. And I'm talking about the right order of worship culture. So that's why I'm teaching this today. And one thing that really struck me, and I remember this, was Jesus. When Jesus was making a, a, a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, you know what he wrote? He wrote a donkey. You know what happened? The people came before him. They spread the palm fronts. They spread their best of clothes. They said, oh, hail the king of Israel, who has come to redeem us from all our enemies. Because they saw the king was coming. They saw Jesus as the king was coming. And he was riding on a donkey. But you know one thing that just occurred to me? That that donkey may actually be thinking that all the praise and all the hosanna are for him. And as he, as, he, as he struggled, I said, wow, they like me here. You know, They respect me. I must be very anointed. No, donkey, you're not the anointed one. You're anointing. Yes, you are carrying the Messiah. But you need to recognize that you are a, you are a vehicle. Okay, in the hand of the Messiah to be able to enter into Jerusalem. So everyone is there. So Jesus needed a donkey. Jesus said to the people, go and get me a donkey. Jesus couldn't walk through into Jerusalem by himself. He needed a donkey, yes. So we need one another. So Jesus needed a donkey. But a donkey shouldn't say, because they are praising me right now. I think they are praising me. No, they're not praising you. <laughs> you get it? They are praising the one who is riding on you. So every worship leader needs to understand. That your gifting is not what people are praising. Your gifting is not yours. It's a gift. You didn't work for it. God gave it to you. So you have to know how to use it within the confine of order and structure so that we can together move God's kingdom forward. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I want to be systematic about this. And I know that a lot of this are going to be ground Some of the things I'm going to say are going to be ground shaking. But it's very important for us to set a new order, the right order. For, and that's where my anointing flows. My, I'm an apostle, so we set in place order. We bring kingdom order to place. Okay, all right. And if we adjust ourselves to the right order of things, then we will see the glory of God one more time full, flow into our churches, flow into our corporates, flow into our families, and we'll see healings, we'll see miracles, we'll see signs, we'll see wonders, we'll see powerful interventions, we'll see angels moving and bringing the purpose of God upon the earth, even right in the midst of the crisis. That's what happened. What happened on the Red Sea was an angel, one angel touched the Red Sea and the Red Sea parted. So we need angelic interventions, but every Moses must be willing to work with all the Miriams. Amen. Praise the Lord. So in this study, we are going to analyze some sample songs, what I call sample songs of the Bible. Don't forget I told you the Bible is a book of songs. It's a book of creative. And if you are wondering, if you, if you are a breath of idea, you don't know what, how to get ideas from getting the Bible. Read the Bible, meditate on it, study the scriptures, okay? And prayerfully consider what God will have you do. So let's look at some sample songs. And I want to look at one song, song of what I call songs of Deborah, and another song uh, which I call the song of Moses, another one. And if time allows me, I'll look at the song of David because we need to look at all these things because these are principles, okay? These are samples that God has given to us. So let's look at the book of Deuteronomy chapter 31. The 31 and verse 30. And I think I'll read all the way to chapter 32, verse 1 to 47. But let me go on first by talking about, first of all, the purpose of songs. Now, if songs have purpose. Musicals have purpose. Creatives must have purpose. And I'll probably give you about three or four of what I believe in my little understanding of God about the songs, about the purpose of songs, or what I call the purpose of creative content. 
for those of you who are, whether you are acting, you are creating a drama content, okay, for the kingdom of God or whatever it is, the purpose. All right. Number one, songs are for building of legacies. Now, I live in, the, I live in Nigeria. There are some songs we call Nigeria Evergreen Songs. Songs that had been reigning since the 50s, in the days of the forefathers. And this song still holds sway today. Do you know why? Because they, uh, they, are, they were designed by those people back in those days, okay, as legacy material. So, strong songs are for memori- memorable legacies or memorializing legacies. Uh, I told you about the song of the bow the other time, song of David, which is sung towards his friend. And that's one of the purposes of song. So, everyone developing content, writing songs, must have that at the back of your mind. Can this song, okay, carry legacies through? Can this song go beyond my generation? There are some people that call one one hit wonder. You don't want to be a, you don't want to be a one hit wonder songwriter. You want to be a songwriter who wrote, who writes songs that are evergreen. That even after you have gone, your songs are still being done. That's very 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 important, and that is what should be the focus of every content developer, every creative content developer, every songwriter, every worship leader. Would my song? Can my song? Become a memorable resource for legacies yet unborn. Number two, songs are for are vehicles for establishment of philosophies and culture. Very important. Okay, so there is no talking about culture and philosophies. Okay, being fundamentally endemic in systems, except they are carried through the vehicle of songs. That's how powerful songs are. Songs convey a people's agreed value system. And they create roadmaps for social practices and behaviors. Okay, I want you to listen to me because it's very, very important. And I'm targeting those of you who are creating content. Don't forget, I'm targeting those of you who are singers or songwriters or play actors or playwriters or poets. Very, very important because you need to understand it. So songs are meant to be vehicles to carry value systems and create roadmaps for social practices and social behaviors. For instance, in the 60s, okay, I was born in the 60s, but I was a baby then. But there are some songs that were written back in those days. One of those songs was written and I was being sung by my, by my, by my parents. I think I must have some line that talks about roti or moniti or she, something like that, which basically means remember your family lineage. I mean, don't desecrate your family name. Family name is everything. They will say things like, uh, name is golden. Um, legacies are very uh, irreplaceable. That was a that was a value system in the sixties, in the fifties, in the fifties and the sixties. And so musicians wrote along that line, and what the musicians wrote along that line formed culture, formed behavior, formed value system. Such a way that I remember when I was going to the secondary school in the eighties. Okay, now as a young lad, my my uh, family told me. We are going to boarding school right now. Don't go and disgrace our family name, Roti or Maniti Watch. That means remember the family name to protect it. That was what I had growing up. Okay? And that was what formed our behavioral pattern. So everyone knew not to mess up because if you messed up, you will be desecrating and bringing the family name into disrepute. And you didn't want to do that because you knew that you had to answer to people, okay, for getting caught in ram- robbery, getting caught in rape, getting caught in molestation. You didn't want to do that. So everyone, so you could see the level of crime, even though there were crime in every, but the level of crime was not as, was not as manifest. But over time, there has been an erosion of value system. So this is the kind of songs that people sing. They talk about 30 billion in my account. So what do you see? So you see hush puppies going into fraud. You see young people at their 20s being caught for money because you see money rituals on the increase it's because songs craft values songs provide road, roadmaps for behaviors <laughs> yeah so that's what happens so if we are going to see a win a reduction in crime we have to go back to the root of the songs that we sing and the songs that emanate from our entertainment unit if we do not control that if we do not do something about the quality and the value of the songs, I tell you, there is no talking about how to change values. Because songs craft values. Okay, that's it. That's basically it. And even if I don't say anything other than this, okay, I think we can just go home. 
But I'll, I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll say, say some things more about the value or about the, about the, the purpose of songs. So let me go back to the book of that Deuteronomy that I promised. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 10 to 13, and then verse 19, and then verse 22, and then verse 30. Deuteronomy 31, verse 10 to 13, verse 19, verse 21 to 22, and then verse 30. So let's go. So then Moses commanded the people of Israel. It says, at the end of every seven years, in the year for canceling death, during the festival of tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God, at the place he will choose, you shall read this law before them in the hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and children, and the foreigners residing in your towns, so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. So the reason Moses was documenting the song was so that the people can read, so that the people can learn, so that the people can have adjusted behavior to know how to fear the Lord. So it was very intentional. So song, Moses, the song of Moses was designed intentionally to create a social roadmap. Listen to this. It says this. It says, their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So he said to them, you are going into a strange land, to a new land, but there you have to understand how to behave when you get there. So that's what the things songs do. Songs teach us behavior. Or songs should be able to influence behavior. Okay, you get that. Okay, let me look at verse 19 of the same 31 with you. It says, now write down the song and teach it to the Israelites. Did you see that? Write down the song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it so that it may be a witness for me against them. All right. That's the purpose of song. Songs are meant to be written down with one intention only, to teach. So songs are instructional materials for nation building. So if we are going to see our nations all over the world rebuilt, we have to inspire, and I say this to the church, the church has to take the front line to inspire content and release also Believers within our local assemblies who will design content, either with musical content, drama content, or whatever content, poetic content, that will influence and shape and culture. It's high time, and I want to say this to believers, it's high time we stop complaining about crime in the society, about rape and whatever it is. It's high time we started developing content. It's high time we started speaking to our young people or our prophets in our local churches to be able to start, sit down, and design songs that will teach, songs that will instruct, songs that will bring people to a clear understanding of what God expects in terms of behavior. Now, that means that we need to have accurate behaviors ourselves. Okay, so let's go on. In verse 21, it says, And when the disasters, when, when many disasters and calamities, calamities come on them, this song will testify against them. Because it will not be forgotten by their descendants. Did you see that? Songs are, thus, are so powerful that they remain evergreen even after the creator of the song was gone. That's what we call evergreen songs. And there are some songs that are now being remixed by young people. I look at it and I, I laugh. I, I see a lot of songs by the iconic fella, Anikula Pokuti. Okay, people, wrong people remix it. Now, that, I know he, he wasn't a church guy, but his father was a reverend. His father was a bishop of a local assembly church, of a local assembly. So that guy fed off the church. That guy, like, like Beethoven, that guy grew up learning the catechism, learning about hymns. He grew up understanding about music. Now, I know the devil tried to take him away, but the, up till today, okay, the thing that he wrote, the sound, that was a sound that he emitted, okay, he still creates roadmaps, of course. Wrong roadmaps, bringing people into all manner of things. I don't want to talk about that. That is to tell you how powerful songs are and how iconic and how they change people's behavior and how they get carried into the future as evergreens. Even when Fela is dead and gone, people are still doing all manner of things that he thinks he speaks about. That is how powerful songs are. That's why we have to be intentional about how we raise songwriters and I say this as a pastor of the church. How we raise songwriters in our church. How we put the demand, fresh demand, on our content creators in our local assembly to write songs that will speak to instruction, speak to correcting behavior, and influencing social changes. Very, very important. 
Now, I, I, I can't, let me talk about Fela again. Fela will talk about social injustice. He got that from his father. Because his father preached every Sunday against injustice. His mother too. And how he will grow up and that. He will write something in that regard. Yeah, he spoke to him and all things. But honestly, the things that, that grew him were fundamentally embedded in the word of God. And that's why today you see that. You see a lot of things happen. So it's important for us to understand the power of legacy creation. I don't know whether you understand that. So Moses was now speaking, I think in verse 22. It says, so Moses wrote down the song that day and taught it to the Israelites. He wrote down the song that day and taught it to the Israelites. And verse 30 says, And Moses recited the words of this song from the beginning to the end in the hearing of you, of you all of Israel. Now, let me tell you something about, what, about what, what, what God says here. When the Bible says, And Moses recited the words, the word there, the word there, the, 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 the expression words there used is, an Hebrew word, Daba, which basically talks about the decree of the Lord or the judgment of the Lord or God's purpose for a nation or a people. The proceeding word of the Lord. So this was what happened. Moses knew what God was saying to a people back in those days. Then he wrote it down and he taught it to the people. And that is what it is till today. The people of Israel still walk in that legacy of that song or, or what you call the Ten Commandments. Okay. <laughs> or what you call the law, the Torah. There were songs. Moses sat down and wrote them as songs. Okay. Let's go back to another scripture because we need to open this Bible study. Deuteronomy 32, verse 44 to 47. Deuteronomy 32, 44 to 47. The Bible says, Moses came with Joshua, the son of Nun, and spoke all the words of this song. Uh, the, the kind of things I'm hearing. So David, so Moses was actually a songwriter. Moses was a content creator. Moses actually was a creative, okay, writer. Because the scripture says, Moses came with Joshua, son of Noah, and spoke all the words of the song in the hearing of the people. When Moses finished reciting all these words to all Israel, did you see that? When if it is reciting, I, I think I think they, they talk about songs, they call songs recitals. Okay, God, Bible is using this powerful word like songs, reciting. He says, when Moses finished reciting these words to Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them, you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. What's trying to say? He's saying, you will do well to ensure your longevity of life. If you will listen to the song, if you will commit the songs to heart, if you will sing them to you, to yourself, and to your children's children, if you will carry them as legacy resources in your heart into the future, so that when you live in the midst of unbelievers and corrupt nations, you will be guided and you will be adjusted and corrected and instructed by the content of the songs that you are hearing this day. And that's how powerful songs are. Now, I, I told this story uh, on a lighter board. I, mean, I, was made, I was called to be a chair to chair a, a, a wedding anniversary. And then these songs started blaring. I mean, these people started singing the songs, were excited. They were, and it was a very lewd song, whatever it is. I don't know where they got the DJ from. But by the time my wife and I left, that place on our way home, we find ourselves humming this song. That is to tell, and we are both pastors himself, the gospel. That's to tell you how powerful songs are. If you don't want to hum wrong song and get your mind configured wrongly, don't listen to the wrong song. Be careful what songs to listen to because songs are that powerful. So Moses was saying to them, Hey, people, you need to understand that these songs will craft your future and the future of your children. These songs will provide you indicators. This song will help you to bring to remembrance the things that your God has asked you to do and to be and how to live long in the land you are not crossing the Jordan to possess. Don't forget, they are crossing into one level of life to another. They were migrating into a bigger level, a place where we call the promised land. I just pray for someone today that God will also bring you into the place of the promised land for your life. 
and that he will give you wisdom and understanding and also the viable value system that you need to be able to survive right in the midst of that system in the name of Jesus. All right. So number three thing I want to talk about, about the purpose of songs. Now, when musical instruments are added to songs, songs become tools for entertainment, for relaxation, and for rejoicing. That's what most people take songs to be. Oh, it's, a, it's, just, to, it's just to shake the body, just to move your body. That's just one of the many purposes. In fact, songs don't become dancey or entertainment or until you put music to them. But songs are not music. Songs are lyrics. Music is different. So every lyric must be added to value-driven songs. I want to say that again. So every songwriter, okay, the first thing you need to think about first is not the bedu. <laughs> Let me use my life purpose language. It's not the sound. What you need to think about first when you are designing or creating a music content or a creative content is the value statement. Because that's what is fundamentally needed to help the people into the future. Okay, now, I haven't said that. Music, when you had when, when, songs, when you had music to the lyrics, then you can begin to have entertainment. You can begin to have relaxation. You can begin to have party. You can party with it because the beat is hot beat or the beat is fast paced or whatever it is, okay? Whatever it is, so whatever it is. But bottom line is, that is just one of the purposes for relaxation, for entertainment, and then for rejoicing. Number four, songs, or what I would like to call musicals, are therapy are for therapy of the mind. So if songs are well worded and the music is well composed, you can actually use songs, okay, for therapy. Case in point, the Bible talks about a king who was losing his mind, who was going to insanity. And then a young man, David, who was a songwriter, who was a psalmist, they brought the young man into the palace of the king and just by singing the song and playing the instrument on the harp, Saul's soul was serenaded and the insanity went. Okay, so that means that song can be such a powerful tool for therapy. So if someone is sick or someone is down, depressed, put in some music, some worship, some worship, put in some worship, put in some music, and you might be able to help. So it's one of the reasons why today, one of the things we just started doing is we started doing a playlist. We started having to send a playlist out to all our members, a worship playlist, so that when it, sometimes you can't pray, sometimes you are down, and you need to be ex, 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 encouraged and inspired. All you need to do is just put in the song. We have taken time to make sure that the songs are full of lyrics that got power, that would help change your life, okay? And I think it's the least we can do, because people go through pressure. So songs will provide that therapy that you need. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, so it's important for us to understand these principles about songs. Let me talk a bit about song being a vehicle of culture. Let me talk a little bit more about that as I go on. One of the greatest indicators for setting a corporate culture is song. When I talk about corporate culture, I'm talking about corporate culture of a local assembly. I, I want to deal with that a little bit. So songs that you sing as a local church should tell a visitor to your church about who you are and what you believe. And I want to say this very clearly. It's very important. Many times, Local assemblies don't have a distinct sound, don't have a distinct identifier in the spirit. Not every church is the same. The spirit of God wants to be reflected different in different churches. Some churches are apostolic churches, some are prophetic churches, some are evangelistic churches, some are teaching dimension churches, some are pastoral churches. Whatever it is that is your identifier in the spirit or your dimension as a local assembly. It's important that you sing songs that will craft that. But this is what happens. Because the people, the Miriams in the local assembly are not rising up with their prophetic edges. They are going to import songs from evangelistic churches into apostolic centers. So the songs don't fit. They are going to import songs from pastoral churches into prophetic centers. So those songs don't fit. Because there are different things that Jesus wants to be in every church. Every church is unique. One church, one spirit, one God, but diverse gifts, diverse manifestations. Even the locations we are positioned are diverse. If you are in America, it's different from if you are in Nigeria. If you are in Afghanistan as a church, your songs have to have a different spirit because the demons you are dealing with are different. The issues, the social issues are different. So every church needs to be able to, first of all, sit down and ask the question, 
What is our unique identifier? Jesus explained this to us in the book of Matthew 16. And I want to really say this to church leaders or people who are crafting worship systems in local churches. Because song is a vehicle for culture, for corporate culture, for local church culture. Listen to this. Matthew 16, verse 13 to 16. Jesus said, the Bible says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They said, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So this was, there was public opinion. There were various public opinions about the identity of Jesus. Some said it was Jeremiah, the one of the prophets. Some said it was Elijah, one of the prophets. Some said it was John the Baptist, prayer raised from the dead. People always have different opinions about what a local church ought to be, about what Jesus ought to be in a local church. But look at what Jesus said. So now Jesus now reclined and said, okay, I have had your summations from different uh, opinion leaders. You, but who? Verse 15. But what about you, he asked. What do you say that I am? And that's when the robber meets the road. That's when it, it dawned on all his followers that they didn't actually know his spirit. That they, act, they didn't actually know who he was. They had been following him for three years, but they didn't know his spirit. One of the saddest things for church leadership in this day is that we have fair people following our churches, supposedly in our churches, who don't know our spirit. Who really do not, who, and I have explained this several times. People think your church is the church they are coming from. People think this church is not different from the church they were born into. Okay. But they do not understand that every church has an identifier in the spirit and that has a purpose that God wants it to be. So the question we need to answer in every church is, who do you say that Jesus wants to be in this church? Now, when we have that answer, then we can create worship out of that. Okay, so Jesus wants to reveal himself uh, different in every local church. So the conclusion of that matter, you know the story. Simon Peter was the only one who was able to answer in verse 16. He says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son. Now, that's of the living God. That's a powerful revelation. So, yeah, he was a prophet and everything, yes. He was a miracle worker, yes. But the revelation that Jesus wanted everyone to know of himself in that moment was, I am not just one of the prophets. I am the son of God. I am not just one of the prophets. I am the Christ, the Messiah. And only Peter had a revelation of that. So guess what? If Peter was going to write a song about what Jesus was, he would write from his revelation of Jesus being the Christ, being the son of God. If all the other disciples were going to write a song about Jesus, they were going to be writing about him from the perspective of being a prophet or being one of a good man or being a healer. But every local church is different and the smell of Jesus in every church must be very clear. The sound of the Lord in every church must be very clear. And who Jesus is in your midst should be reflective in your worship song and in your songs you sing. So it's not every song that you can sing. I always tell them in our church, I always tell them our, our worship team, you can't just bring any song to sing in our church. This is the capstone. And the capstone, we are believing the Lord that we'll be able to reflect the value of the capstone. The value of the capstone, we divided it or we captured it under, under eight letters. Capstone, C-A-P-S-T-O-N-E, which basically is C. C is covenant. So in covenant, we expect that our believers will sing songs on truth, on integrity, on commitment. As A, apostolic doctrine, means we want our people to be able to understand purpose, kingdom assignment, volunteering spirit of serving the Lord, and going for persecution and wading through suffering. These are some of the things that, that define us as a local assembly. We talk about P, being pioneering songs. So we expect that people will sing songs like Breaking Limits, Okay, conquering impossibilities, prophetic vision, innovating things, starting new ideas. These are the things that reflect a pioneering spirit. We have shepherding. We need to begin to have songs that speak to love one another, help one another, caring for one another, community, strong fellowship among ourselves, koinonia, sharing. These are the things that we need to teach. On. Now, I teach on this thing, but the question is, I also need the Miriams in the house to take the things I teach and amplify them into songs. So we need to be able to create contents locally in our churches to be able to do that. And I could go on and talk about that. Our church talks about teaching as a core value. 
That means that songs must speak to discipleship, the studying the word of God, modeling the Christ life, being examples to other believers. Because these are the things that characterize training or teaching, as the case may be. We say we're also a church of order. Order means we speak to structured spiritual life. We speak to intentionality in living. We speak to fruit of the spirit, especially in self-controlled life. Very, you can't say anything anyhow. You can't live anyhow. Because the spirit of Christ that birthed the capstone is a spirit of order. So anything outside that is a different smell or a different sound. We spoke about our church being a place of networking, which basically means we encourage ministry teamwork. We encourage interactions, collaborations. So nobody goes alone and does stuff and takes the glory. We want to be able to build a team. We want to be able to build a network. People working together. Husband and wife as a team. Families as a team. Friends as a team. People in the church as a team. These are the things that are unique identifiers of our local assembly called the capstone. The E speaks to singing song equalization. What is equalization? It speaks to singing songs that all believers are equal. Equal before God in spirit. So there's nothing like gender inequality. Men and women are the same in our church. They have to be. Okay. No social class. No ethnicity or racism is allowed in our local assembly. So we have to deal with those issues. They never must be allowed to fester. The issue of ranking instead of hierarchy. And I want to speak about that. There's a difference between ranking and hierarchy. What is ranking? Ranking is when everybody <clears throat> has capacity to produce results, regardless of age, regardless of social class. Hierarchy is there is a there is a there is one, two, three. You have to be superior. So there is no superiority. In our local church, I am the lead pastor, but I have other people who have the same capacity with me. Okay, I am the senior elder, but there are other elders who I lead. I want, I expect them to think powerfully. Think creatively and think proactively because that is how we build the kingdom. We equalize, we sit together, we deliberate, we come up with ideas and visions for our church. Okay, and these are all the things that actually should characterize every local. I just told you a little bit about our church. And I do hope, praying, that we will be the, all these things and we'll be able to bring songs out from this value statement that I've been teaching or that God has revealed to us as identifiers of our local church. Amen. So every kingdom community, whether a family church, or whether a family or a church, needs a musician or a psalmist. And I like to use the word kingdom community is a word I like to use because the word church has been bastardized. Because really a church is a kingdom community. Okay. But the key word is a kingdom of people who are in community together, who share, who have fellowship, who have interaction. So every family needs to have those, these things. They will need to have um, bossing worship. We, have to, we need to have effective worship system, even as a family. Every family needs to have a spot in the realm of the spirit where they worship from. In such a way that even if you don't see yourself for a long time, by the time you begin to sing some songs, all of you connect with it, and you can build a spirit content and activate the angels of God to be able to bring God's glory back upon your lives. Okay. Two, corporates have to be able to build memorial of God's dealings with them through worship. I said that before. I want to say that again. You need to intentionally build memorial. What has God dealt with you as a family? You have to bring out a song out of that. Then number three, worship ought to be homegrown. And I want to encourage every church leader to ensure and to insist that people who sing, who lead your worship, sing from your unique experiences. Every church experience is different. The dealings of God, okay, with every generation is different. And every generation should be able to carry <coughs> or document, yeah, I love this, document God's dealing with them and make it into songs that they will sing. Because every time you do this and you sing the song out of the dealings of God with you, you bring the grace of God upon your local house, okay? So a culture of worship must be established. And when we talk about culture of worship, it means a culture of team. Because worship really, in the context of what I've been teaching for a while now, means team. There must be a culture of leadership in the house. There must be a pastor. There must be a father. You can call it a CEO of a company. Who leads the team? And there must be people in the house who support the vision. There must be people in the house who are responsive followers. Okay. So, in that context, for worship to be acceptable, for worship to be dynamic, for worship to, um, to bring in the glory of God, there must be unity between the leader and the led. 
Okay, I, I want to say that again. In the world today, especially in the world of democratization, where everything must be put to vote, people want to vote on what God is saying to the church. People want to vote on what God is doing in the church. They want to have a say. No, you need to understand, you need to recognize that there is leadership. There must be leadership. And yes, I want to also speak to leadership. The leadership must be responsible and must be responsive. It must, there must be a leader who is hearing the voice of the Lord. A Moses must be hearing God's voice and saying, this is what God is saying. Let's go this way. This I'm hearing God say, don't go back to Egypt. Let's move forward towards the promised land. The rest is before us, but we can do it. Who, who can inspire hope? Who can inspire people? Now, they, we need such leaders. Proactive leaders, strong leaders, spirit-filled leaders. But also, we need membership that is in alignment with the purpose and the vision of the leadership. There must be no breaking of rank. There must be no leader that is leading effectively and the people who are supposed to be following are slouching. Every follower must be asking the question, what is God saying to my leader? What is God saying to our prophet? What's God saying to our apostle? What's God saying to pastor to do? Pastor, what's in your heart right now? What is God asking to build? When we have these things in alignment, we will be able to bring a dynamic water culture, okay, that will bring the glory of God upon the earth. Let me share one scripture with you as we begin the task towards the end right now. And I said I was going to share the song of Deborah. So let's look at the book of Judges chapter 5. The book of Judges chapter 5 from verse 1 to 40, 41. I will not be able to read all. I'll just speak a few verses. But when you get home, please read the book of Judges chapter 5 from verse 1 to 41. But I want to pick on a few verses. I want to pick on verse 1, verse 2, verse 6, verse 7, verse 9, and then verse 10. I'll just go in that regard. Let me start by verse 1, verse 1. Judges chapter 5. Now, I also want to declare this in the name of the Lord. Many people say women cannot lead. Women are not allowed to speak in churches. You have not read the book of Judges chapter 5. Because this was a woman leader that was rising and was bringing salvation to the whole nation. You need to study the book of Judges chapter 5, please. Look at this. Chapter 5 from verse 1. It says, On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Ainoam, sang the song. They sang the song. When the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Did you see that? When the people take the lead, when the princes in Israel take the lead, princes means leaders, princes mean heads of clans. So there must be heads of clans who will take the lead. And it says, when people willingly offer themselves, so there must also be people, followers, who have a volunteering spirit to willingly offer themselves to agree to the vision. He says, when that happens, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, look at verse 6 and 7. It says, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jahel, the roads were abandoned. Travelers took the winding path. Village life in Israel ceased. Ceased until I, Deborah, arose. Arose a mother in Israel. Let me read verse, verse 9 to 10. It says, my heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. And then he went up by saying, praise the Lord. So you see, the, the word praise came up, up about twice there. Praise basically means adoration of God. You know, we all do praise and worship. But you know what it really means in the true sense of it? There can be no true adoration of God except there is an agreement between a forthright proactive leadership and a supportive, volunteering followership. It's, it's only when the princes take the lead. Okay, when the leaders take the lead. And as a nation, leaders have to take the lead, not rip the flock. Take the lead. And then, only then, do followers respond by volunteering. Now, when we have that together, then what we have is praise. What we have is adoration of God. What we have is true worship. So true worship then basically means there must be a place where there is a teamwork of leaders and followers. I, can even, I can't overemphasize that enough. By God's grace, next week I'm sure I'll probably be sharing some things about uh, collaboration in this regard. I'm going to be looking at the life of David and teaching about collaboration in corporate life. Very, very important. But bottom line is corporate life becomes restored when leaders lead and people willingly volunteer themselves. Only then can we have what we call prophetic intervention. And birth such a thing, okay, like happened in the of Deborah. When Deborah's arise, 
You know, Deborah arose with a song of deliverance. And I, want to, I said I was going to talk about the song of, of, of Deborah. Because there were things in that song that I just said I, 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 I like to share. For instance, in the song of Deborah, you saw that talks about a hopelessness, a national hopelessness. Things were so terrible in their day. I mean, the roads were abandoned. You know why roads were abandoned? Because there was crime. There was terrorism. There was kidnapping. There was violence on the street. It says travelers took the winding path. That means that travelers couldn't go on the main road. They couldn't go on the high street. They had to go through bush paths. Why? Because if you go through the highways, unfortunately, that's what's happening in Nigeria right now. When people travel from interstate to interstate, they get kidnapped. I mean, there are many cases of kidnaps and ambushes right now in this country that God has to intervene. And how will God have intervene? If we have church members rising up, declaring the mind of God in agreement with their prophetic leaders. So there must be leadership in the church and there must be followership. When that happens, God will be praised. But when that happens, Deborah's will rise. Amen. And this day I'm saying we need women to rise. We need our women to rise as intercessors, to rise as judges, to rise as leaders. Okay. We need Deborah's to rise and take their place. Deborah was a prophet. A woman, if you are listening to me today, you can be a prophet of God through whom God will provide us roadmaps and solutions to Nigeria's problem. You don't have to, don't listen to what people are saying about women can't govern, women can't rule, women are just good for the kitchen. No, no, there are women who are homemakers like Jahel, but there are also women who are prophetic and who are leaders and judges like Deborah. Because until Deborah agreed to go with Barak, they couldn't deliver the nation. But when Deborah, the woman of God, rose up, and you heard what she said. She said this, I want to read verse 6 and 7 again, that book of Judges chapter 5. I want to read it again. It says, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the roads were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. Village life in Israel ceased. They ceased until I, Deborah, arose. I rose a mother in Israel. Can I declare in the name of the Lord that God would send saviors upon our mountain, this nation? That will deliver our land from the chokehold of the enemy. From the spirit of corruption. That God will raise women. That God will release right now. I declare in the name of the Lord. I speak to the spirit of our women. I say rise Deborah. I say let Deborah arise. I say let the giants arise. I say let them bring salvation to our, uh, to our nation. That has eluded us by the recklessness of the men folk. I declare right now. Let every woman in this house rise and take their place. And be true mothers in Israel. Because when they do that. Then the future of our nation and the future of our children and our children's children get secure. Hey, Amen. Woo! I just feel like I just feel an anointing right now in the name of the Lord. So it's important for us to understand the power of worship. So De Deborah says, God is worship when leaders lead and follow followers um, volunteers, uh, followers volunteers. Sorry. God is praised. God is praised when leaders take the lead and followers willingly volunteer to serve. When there's that collaboration, then we see uh, a release of angelic interventions and then the nation is saved and our women are raised up and the kingdom of God is birthed and solution comes back to our land. Amen. I say amen to that. So as I bring this to a conclusion, I want to say a, a few things in summary how this thing works. I already spoke about it. Moses and Miriam. Don't forget it. Moses delivered the lyrics. Miriam put the music. Okay? Moses spoke the word. Miriam repeated the exact thing that Moses said. She didn't go and bring another word from another pastor. She spoke the exact word. So, people in your local, in your local churches, listen to what your pastor is speaking, spe speaking, or your apostle, and take those words and document them and put lyrics to them and form them into content that will change the world. Amen. So there must be a collaboration between the leadership and the followership. Amen. Alright, so bringing it close, how do these things work? Number one, leader documents God's dealing with him through teaching in oral form like I'm doing right now, or in written form like I'm doing when I write books. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's important. Okay, Moses said this this way. He said, he put this way in, in verse 32 of uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32 verse 2. It says, let my teaching fall like rain, and my words descend like dew. 
like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. So it's important. We need to have teaching. So I want to challenge apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists, governmental spirits, uh, ministries over churches. Teach. Teach content. Teach value. Teach holiness. Teach kingdom of God. Teach the truth of God's word. Amen. And then you will see a new day begin to rise up within your local church. Amen. Number two, gifted followers must bring their creative content out of the leader's words. I'm just bringing that as a summary. Every one of you who has capacity to write songs or to write a drama or to write a poem, you think you're a poet, you think you're a singer, you're a musician, take your pastor's words. Take your pastor's messages. Okay. Now listen to me. If you cannot, if you don't feel good about that pastor, go to another church. But every one musician, every Miriam, every prophet, every psalmist must belong to a house where you are able to put music to the to the word content of the prophetic of the prophetic leader. There must be no breakage between every leader's vision and the follower's response. Very important. I'm trying to overemphasize this thing. It's very important for us to do that. So the heart of the fathers must be joined to the heart of the sons so that the true blessings of God can flow into our lives and ministry. And worship will do that. The worship, harmonized worship, a real healthy right order of worship culture will bring an harmony between the heart of the fathers, apostolic fathers, and the heart of their sons in the name of the Lord so that together we can bring the blessing of the Lord upon our lives and break the yoke and curses over our families, our churches, and over our nations. Malachi 4 verse 5 and 6, you can read it. Our worship then in a local assembly must be outpost of value systems as revealed through God's dealings with the leader. So ask the Lord, Lord, give me a leader who knows about your mind and who can bring your will up on the earth through teaching or preaching of the ministry of the word. And then when you locate that local assembly or you locate that apostle, follow them and build with them a value system that can change the world. And finally, it's important for me to say this. No song from a local assembly is authentic. They say this. No song from any local assembly is authentic except it's an outpost from the leader's vision statement or the leader's corporate blueprint as he says has been revealed to him by the Lord. So we need to work together with our leaders. Worship leaders, work together with your prophet, your apostle, your teacher. Let everybody work together with one another. Miriam worked together with Moses so that together we can bring the will of God upon the earth. So that like Deborah and Barak can join together and bring forth a song, a song of deliverance over the nation, so also we can bring deliverance over our different nations in crisis and we can bring the will of God to bear upon the earth. Until I see you again, I want to say, Lord, bless and keep you. The Lord give you a song and a sound from heaven that is unique to your house. And through that song, may deliverance be wrought in your nation. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. For more counseling, all prayers, and spiritual support, please contact us at 0802-318-2030 on WhatsApp. You can also visit us at www.thecapstoneonline.com. Capstone.